Welcome to Real Estate Raw, where we will discuss some real world examples of the do's and don'ts in the world of real estate. You'll be introduced to industry leading experts who will reveal behind the scenes tips and tricks. Okay, we've got giggles already. <laughs> okay, everyone, welcome to the next episode of Real Estate Raw. Today we have uh, Julie here from Colwell Lions, which has been trading for now over 30 years in the Brisbane area. Correct, yes. And you've been with them for close to? Approximately seven years now. Seven years yes. doing conveyancing in property. We've also got Sheridan Regan here, who's going to assist with some questions. And with her first podcast, you're a little bit nervous? or A little bit, but it should be good. Should be good. Okay, so um, look, we just wanted to just bring you in here today and just have a bit of a chat, just a little bit about how your role in conveyancing works with real estate. But um, I think what um, we just want our listeners to know is like a little bit more about the behind the scenes and what's happening and some of the pitfalls and um, and some of the things people can avoid as well in in when so they're selling their house and they've got a conveyancer involved. So I guess sort of the first question off off the bat here is sort of um, what. What do you see at the moment in the industry that's um, working really, really well? And and after that, what do you see that's not working well? Um, I think it's coming down to communication is really the one thing that works really, really well. Um, if people are choosing solid real estate agents that are constantly speaking to clients, um, the same goes with brokers, bankers, um, generally approaching um reputable people that have been in the industry for a long time that's generally working the best um, because it generally ensures a smoother transaction as well so less stress for all involved so what's some i guess okay that's a good point so what's some of the things that can you know reduce that stress like what do you see um, a good conveyancer do compared to what a bad conveyancer could possibly do to cause that stress what preparations do you do for the clients to help reduce that stress it's all about organization so just knowing the the process inside and out so personally what I would do is once receiving a contract is going through that contract thoroughly making sure that we make a diary note of every single condition that is due and making a good solid time timeline on what clients need to do in within a certain time frame to be able to achieve the settlement so it's important that clients are communicating with their conveyances but that they've got a conveyancer that is going to read the contract properly as opposed to a bit of a rush job because they might be a bit busy so if they're doing that it's it's going to be less stress on the client because they're not having to get an 11th hour phone call to say by the way settlements tomorrow you've got a document to sign Um, that's the last thing that anybody wants to get it, so <clears throat> being you know, proactive, I think, is, is, is key. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of contracts that you know, we've been involved with that, um, you know, if the conveyance is not on task and they're not watching what potentially could happen, Correct. causes a lot of issues. So what would be something that commonly happens in, the, in your industry where you get to settlement and it's like breaks on, something's been missed, or, you know, what, what's probably one of the biggest things that could, could potentially hold that up? Um, so it's all about timelines. So banks have certain cutoff timeframes. So if a conveyance is not on the ball and meets that time frame with like ordering checks, for example, that can severely delay a settlement or alternatively it can cause the settlement to completely fall over. So it's so critical that um, the conveyancer is doing all of that immediately. Um, we do provide constant updates to clients to say we've done this we've done this Um, not everybody does that so I would suggest from a client's perspective if they're not getting that communication from a conveyancer that they need to be following that up Um, same goes with building and pest finance conditions on contracts Um, if they're not following those time frames and satisfying a condition or attending to negotiations in the right time frames that can also mean a contract falling over and a client losing an opportunity to buy or sell a property or potentially even being in breach of contract, depending on the situation. Um, But certainly severe repercussions by by not doing it. 
Okay, so I mean, I guess you know, I mean, um, with uh, like our agency, like a lot of our agents are very proactive in helping negotiate that sort of outside of the conveyancing Most definitely. sector. So, do you find that that's an important part of making this whole process work? It definitely is, and we get a lot of feedback from clients as well. Um, we work with a number of agencies, and the number one thing is whether or not an agent has been proactive in communicating to a client and really preparing them for what's to come. Um, The good thing is that the agents that we're currently dealing with at the moment, yourselves included, that we don't have to chase a lot because the information's already been provided to the client. So really then our role is really just advising a client of what their... um, what's the word I'm looking for, what their obligations are for particular situations that might arise. So it's a team effort really, making sure that the whole process is done, you know, in tandem with the agent, with the conveyancer, with everyone else that's involved to make it work well. Most definitely. If you have one weak link, it can potentially mean that the whole thing falls apart. Do you have so. any stories that you can share that you possibly have learned Ooh, over the years? That <laughs> a lot of stories. Um, my number one thing would be don't sell fact on a conveyance. If you don't have the experience or the knowledge, um, because the amount of situations that we've come across where people, whilst we understand, are trying to save a bit of money, um, you're potentially putting yourself in in the danger zone. So we have had a few transactions that have had self-actors on the other side and unfortunately it, it goes south pretty quickly. That so was something we were talking about earlier before you came in about do you have many people that you come across that do self-act? It's not... Um, look, I would probably say two out of ten maybe, one out of ten contracts that we get would be a self-actor on the other side. So it's not overly common because most people would rather pay that money to a solicitor to ensure that they have a smooth transaction and having the ability to step away and just do what they're told. Um, So it's not overly common because a lot of agents are getting in there first and advising them against it. So not a lot, but it does happen. Yeah, I guess when you what, you know, what, what your cost may be, you know, you're looking at what, I don't know exactly sort of what your cost might be, sort of maybe 1500 maybe 2000 for a sale? Yeah, um, well, for a sale, you're looking at 715 inclusive mm-hmm. of GST. Yep. So as a seller, you don't need to do any searches. Yep. Um, from a purchase perspective, yep. we charge professional fees at 880 inclusive yep. of GST, and then it would be any searches on top of top that. Of that. Um, it does depend on the council to what amount you're looking at for searches um, the benefit that we have is we don't charge a termination fee so regardless of what we've done on the file mm-hmm. we won't charge you if that contract falls over you'll only pay for any searches if you've asked for them to be done up front that's pretty generous and that takes the risk off a purchase and a, and a sale in that respect like yeah. it's all on you guys so most definitely and it's just a case of we hope that clients will then come back to us because it is a common occurrence that contracts do terminate whether it be through building and pest negotiations or finance Um, and it can be an expensive process so if you're paying constantly for somebody's time every time something falls over those costs can add up quite substantially so we try and just help out as much as we can in that aspect. So (coughs) communication is a big thing I mean Sheridan you do a lot you know communication back and forth with with Julie Mm. So yes. I mean, <laughs> <Just a little laughs> <bit. laughs> professional, unprofessional, but um, um, like, th- so the communications that you've had, you know, with Colwell Lions is is a big part of you know making sure the process works. So I mean, in your experience, have you found sort of making sure that that works as well with our business? Yeah, well, definitely. Like I think um, it's one of those things that can differ person to person, company to company. But in terms of, I guess, how often we <laughs> speak, yeah, um, it's usually. Well, it's always been a, like, a straightforward process. You're always on the ball kind of thing, like never following you up for anything. And I think that's the big thing from the real estate perspective and then as well dealing with all the solicitors and conveyances that we deal with. You do have to ensure both parties are just as organised. If on my end I wasn't aware that a settlement was happening today, then that's that, the flow-on effect of that in the office is yep. a pretty big deal. Um, just as well if I was expecting a settlement for the team and the solicitor on the other end had no idea what was going on, that kind of thing. I think communication's key, everyone keeping in the loop, being organised, major diary notes, just 
having to be on top of it. it (laughs) Yeah, I think it's a big part. And then as well, it is a lot. I think the agents do come into play. You know, they can't just remember this is the day of settlement. But there's a lot that happens in the middle that everyone has to be accountable for. And I think that's probably another thing. Like on our end, we don't usually see too many people that, sorry, are very, I guess, stubborn or fixed on self-acting. And I think that's a big reason that the agents always, or the salespeople, sorry, like always are pushing for, you know, here are some good recommendations, go out, shop around. You should really consider having someone act for you professionally. Instead of doing it yourself, there could be things that are just an oversight. Buying and selling is a stressful, busy time. You can't expect a buyer or a seller to be that organised over absolutely everything and, I guess, cover the whole process themselves. Yep. So obviously, you know, um, you know, uh, we know what we do behind the scenes, you know, and what people see and what we do is, you know, like that iceberg sort of scenario. You only see the tip of the iceberg. So give us a little bit of a scenario of just or run through in your mind a list of things that would go, you know, would, would happen in a traditional sort of uh, settlement from from the contract right through to the settlement. Yeah. So we always recommend if people can contact us as soon as they negotiate a price with the contract um, so that we can peruse that before they put pen to paper. Um, once a contract is completely signed by all parties, it's near impossible to make changes, so it's best to get it right the first time. Uh, Once we receive a fully signed contract, we would then proceed to open a new file, send the client out their initial letter, which details all of the due dates, general questions, info, that kind of thing. Um, Obviously then that's at that point where we would diarise all those due dates and we do liaise with the clients, attend to negotiations, ensure they're all satisfied, before we then get to that final stage of the impending settlement. Uh, We're then liaising with the client's bank, so making all those phone calls, crossing all our T's, dotting all our I's to make sure that the client has returned all the documentation they need to, that the bank is satisfied, eventually then booking the settlement with the bank, making sure that they're locked and loaded, ready to go, finalising the figures and ensuring there's enough money to eventually settle. So it sounds simple. But there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. A there's lot of a lot to it. And, admin so and then you've got searches yeah. on top of that as well, which obviously would have to most get definitely. Done. Yeah. So we generally wait until a contract is unconditional before we'll order searches, just so that we can ensure that the client is going to benefit from the money that they're spending on those searches. In saying that, there are a lot of contracts that are subject to like due diligence or counsel searches that we may need to do certain um, investigations prior to that date. It's our job as a conveyancer to provide that search to the client and say to them, look, this is our findings, what would you like to do? So we can't make the decision for a client, but we can simply arm them with the information that they need to make a decision about how they want to proceed forward. Okay, so uh, good point there. So due diligence and counsel searches. like Yes. The due diligence can encompass both of them, whereas the counsel searches is just for counsel searches. Like what, what do you see more often? Is it counsel or due diligence? Um, At the moment we're seeing more of the council searches. Um, From a seller's perspective not a lot of sellers like a due diligence clause within the contract just because of how broad it is. Um, It really enables a buyer to terminate for any reason whatsoever. Where with a council specific clause it's really only enabling the buyer to terminate the contract if the seller didn't agree to get a council approval finalised um, or if it was just a deal breaker in general for them. So more or less we're seeing more council clauses. Um, sellers are a lot more comfortable with that as opposed nice. to a due diligence. And are you seeing them more specific as well? Like are they asking for a council clause based on structures that are approved or is it just an open council clause? Nine out of ten of them are just an open clause just to say that the buyer is entitled to conduct an investigation. If there's anything outstanding, they can naturally negotiate or terminate. Um Look, we do get the occasional clauses, though, that are very specific um, to certain structures on the property, whether that be a shed or a pool or a patio, whatever the case might be. Um, There are also situations where sellers are aware that a certain structure doesn't have an approval, so they will tailor the special conditions again to say, we're not prepared to get this council approved, we're already aware that it's outstanding. So... It essentially lets the buyer know exactly where the seller stands straight up 
yep. and I, not having to waste time. And I guess that's when a good agent would come back into it and help negotiate through those points as well rather than just leave that emotion starts to rise, doesn't it, between buyers and sellers, I'm not doing this, they should have done this. Most definitely, yeah. And that's the good thing, like the dealings that we've had, as I said, we deal with a lot of agents Um we deal with a number of the NVRE agents as well. And what we're finding is that the agents are very upfront from the get-go with clients so people know exactly where they stand and it's not turning into a problem down the track where people start bickering amongst themselves mm. and disputing about whether or not they're going to proceed with a contract. Mm. Um, it does then make for a smoother transaction. It's less stress because everybody's on the same page from the get-go. Yeah, so that's a good point because we're really starting to push and make sure we're getting as much disclosure up front now when we're actually signing up a property. So then when you go to a Form 6, you've got that disclosure in place to say, hey, look, you know, there are these issues already there. Then you go to a contract that's already, you know, transparent and everything's out on the table rather than being hidden later on down the track. And, yeah, people start negotiating tens of thousands of dollars off for something which is quite minor. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, transparency is always a, a good thing when it comes to, you know, presenting contracts. But, I mean... In your industry, you don't always see that. So when it's not as transparent and you see people hiding things and obviously it comes out, yep. what what are the consequences of that once, you know, people start seeing issues which should have been yeah, you know, mentioned? Yeah, it's difficult. It, it's a, a situation that we play um, contract by contract. So it's something that depending on what a search reveals, um, certain notices within a rate search may enforce a seller to have to finalise it, um, regardless of whether they've disclosed it or not. Um, generally, if anything like that shows up, we issue that search straight away to our solicitor to say, what are the obligations here of the seller? Do they have to fix it? So it does definitely depend on what specifically shows up in the search as to whether a seller has to. Um, There are certain things like easements, for example. Um, If they're noted on a title search, they need to be reflected. Any encumbrances on a title have to be reflected within the contract. That can depend on whether or not um, a buyer is prejudiced by the contract, so it could enable them to have to do negotiations with the build uh, with the purchase price, um, and could also allow them the rights to terminate. So that's where it's important from an agent's perspective as well to do the title search and know exactly what's on the property, because it can be the the difference between a contract going through or a contract falling over, or potentially costing the seller a lot of money. So another big thing there as well is covenants. Yep being disclosed as well as a, I guess, an encumbrance, which in in some form it kind of is. Um, Do you see a lot of, because I've got a lot of new estates in this area, don't we, Sheridan? So we're seeing a lot of um, um, sellers now that haven't been passed the covenant on. So then you can't pass it on to the next buyer. I mean, are you seeing any issues at the moment with covenants like that haven't been passed on or haven't been disclosed? I personally haven't had any issues. Um, I've been lucky in that regard that I haven't had any. Um, Nine out of ten times, look, some covenants are very straightforward and it's easy to deal with. Um, Other times I'm saying, look, let's make an appointment to see the solicitor. He can advise you on how to move forward with that um, because potentially it's hard to know because situations are different, covenants are different, contracts are different. It it really would depend on what it is, what the issue is as to whether or not the seller has a right to do or the buyer has a right to do anything about it. Um, I think it, yeah, again, it depends on the, the area that people are buying as well because I'm personally not seeing a lot of it but our other staff members may be yep. as well but that's the good thing our solicitors are always available as well to, to and look over um, that and give that extra advice yeah, yeah yeah definitely and they're always happy to have a chat to them because sometimes people can see they read these covenants and it can be quite substantial the amount of paperwork that is in the contract it can be ridiculous thick um, and it scares people because they don't understand it um, and it's a bit much for them to take on so we encourage them all the time come and have a chat to the solicitor it doesn't cost anything to do it and it'll put their mind at ease especially with anything that needs to be dealt with moving forward if there's something they need to abide by that's probably that people being scared off by something that's 
so huge and daunting. Like reading yeah. through the covenants is almost similar to, I guess, people being scared off when there's pest and building clauses. If they don't actually attend the pest and building inspection and they have people coming with this report, they don't know how to read, they don't know how to interpret it, and then they're probably, you know, coming to you, I'm scared off by one little finding, I, I want out of the contract. Whereas yeah. really if you were at the inspection, if you're there to ask questions to whoever was conducting, you'd probably see a lot less of that or a lot less of buyers being scared off by a huge report because obviously it's not their job to interpret that, what, you know, what they've been yeah. provided. It's not something that they do every day. Same with the covenants, you know, it's not something a lot of people would come by just in a day-to-day. Oh, definitely. And that's, again, it comes down to your conveyancer. Um you're never going to buy a perfect house. Even if you build a brand new house, there's still going to be defects. So you really need to level with a buyer to say, look, what's actually wrong with it? What are your concerns? Um, it's a building a pest inspector's job to list every single item that they're seeing in a property because essentially that's their backside that's on the line because they don't want to be held liable for something coming about later on after the fact so it's important from a conveyances perspective to really reiterate to these buyers look yes we can do any negotiations you like that's not a problem whatsoever but if you're looking at items like loose door handles or chipped paint to ask for a reduction of like twenty thousand dollars would be unrealistic um, and your chances of succeeding with that would be slim um it's, it is daunting, um, but I do reiterate to every buyer, it's their job to make the property seem a lot worse than it potentially is. But again, it's it's the buyers that need to make the decision at the end of the day. Um, and that's the one thing I'd probably reiterate as well. A lot of buyers expect the conveyances to say, yes, this is okay and no, it's not okay. Um, it's important for them to understand we can just advise you of your rights and obligations can't actually make the decision moving forward. But you're right, building and pest is, is the same. Some of those reports can be 50, 60 pages, if not more. So the, the interesting part that, uh, that, that you said there, I mean, um, a lot of the stuff, like, again, it comes down to you know, a good agent. If the, if the agent has prepared a backup contract or has another buyer in the background, right? Yep. The buyer that's currently looking at purchasing a property, you know, potentially trying to call their bluff and say, look, I want to get $10,000 off on this, may not realise that that seller at any time can go, yep, we're not going to do it, and then pass it straight to the next buyer. Like, it's a very risky move to be able to ask for something unreasonable like that because the seller may always – also may be hedging their bets on the next contract behind the scenes. Correct. So yes. but just because it's under contract, it doesn't mean it's sold, right? So right. How, do, how do buyers react then to, you know um, – looking at, you know, trying to, you know, negotiate a sum of money off. I mean, I've, I've seen some in my time where it's been unrealistic, <laughs> yep. right, <laughs> you know, trying to negotiate a, a middle ground. Um, obviously, it's your job to be presenting the um, your client. Yep. But what, what would you sort of, you know, say would be a reasonable thing to ask for in a property that might have minor defects? Like, you know, is it is it a sum of money or is it, you know, what, what, would, what would it be? If I'm acting for a buyer, I would always suggest to them that they ask for a monetary reduction as opposed to listing some items for for repair. Um, The reason being is that it's hard to measure people's satisfaction. Something that's okay for me isn't okay for somebody else. So we can't ever guarantee the level of workmanship is going to be satisfactory to the buyer. So to eliminate that grey area, we say just ask for a reduction you get it yourself done afterwards Mm -hmm. and that way you're happy with the end result. Um, Depending on what issues you're talking about, most buyers will just pluck a figure out that they're happy with as Mm -hmm. a rough estimate. Um, If there's bigger items, like if there's termite damage, those kind of things that could potentially be more structural, Mm -hmm. I would suggest to a buyer to get some quotes just so that you've got a better idea of what it's actually going to cost to fix it. Um, because at the end of the day, we're not builders. I, I could say, yeah, it might cost two grand, but potentially it could cost ten. So, definitely for for works 
more of a structural nature, I would say definitely get a quote. Um, some people just obtain handymans. Most real estate agents also have a list of people that they use, um, whether that be handymen or building and pest inspectors that can generally do a quote very quickly to make sure that there's no hold up with the contract moving forward as well. And usually too, I think as an agency, any agency, if that's what happens in the findings, you know, it's probably important to a buyer not to find out this information and freak out offhand because it is a stressful, crazy time. But exactly what you said, agencies, the salespeople, they have a long list of contacts that can help out in the situation. Like before, Definitely. I guess, getting to the point of just making a, a rash de- decision, you know, speak to the people that helped you find that home. They can also help you get quotes sorted out, you know, the right yep. people for the job before just throwing in the towel, calling it a day yep. from one little thing, I guess. Like, there's always ways to fix any situation. Oh, there is. And it does come down, again, to communication. If if clients are making those phone calls and asking the questions, um, it's amazing how much you can actually get a quick fix and a quick resolution to whatever the, the situation or the problem is. Yeah, that's when you know, agents become like counsellors almost, don't they? Like easy, yes. you know, get those tensions, bring it back down, take that emotion back away and l- exactly. look at the facts. Because yep. quite often yeah, you've got sellers that are committed to a sale. And when, when you get to a contract, like you're not only, you know, making a big you know, financial decision, but it's also a mental, you know, uh, process. Like you, you're packing in your head, you're moving, you're starting to organise where kids might be going and, you know, work and how we're going to travel. Like there's a lot going on in a buyer slash seller's head, you know, when they're making a move. Um, that emotion I've noticed seems at that very end, you know, of, of getting those um, um, conditions passed through, that's when it becomes, I guess, the most tense. Um, yeah. But as soon as we're unconditional, everyone's happy, reviews are flowing, you Price know, champagne. gifts, yep. and set, you know, everyone's <laughs> all good. So, um, um, so going through, I guess, um, your industry specifically, like, um, are you noticing any changes in your industry? Like, have you been in the industry a few years? I mean, you know, Back in the day, it was all faxes and stuff like that. It's going more yep. digital. Uh, settlements now are done through portals, I hear. So it's yes. a very ch- it's a changing landscape for you as it is it for is. us. Yes. Um, and it's been difficult for my boss, especially, um, being in the industry for so long. Um, he's got a wealth of experience, obviously, and we love him to bits, um, but was one person that was very insistent not to change our way of doing things. Um, Settlements have always, for as long as I've known, always been a physical paper settlement with people handing over physical checks. Um, Now we do have the option of doing PEXA, which is an online settlement option. Um, It does, look, there's a small fee that PEXA charges the client to do that, which is $57. Um, The benefits of it is that from a seller's perspective, your money's clearing in your account straight away. You're not having to wait for clearance time of a bank check or anything like that. Um, Registration happens straight away from a buyer's perspective. So we can also get settlements through a little bit sooner throughout the day. So by doing a physical paper settlement, you're having to wait until at least two o'clock as a minimum before a settlement can go through. Um, With PEXA being that online transaction, we can get that through generally by about lunchtime. So people that are looking at moving in and have removal as booked they can start and you know that process a lot sooner as well which takes a lot of the stress out of it because people are just eager beavers to get so, in sometimes the trucks are already in the driveway yeah, waiting that's it. Yeah, <laughs> and waiting in the street <laughs> we've had a truck waiting at um, our other office once like the the buyers were moving themselves in the truck they were sitting with the truck running for about half an hour but this was ages ago it was a physical settlement so yep. as us as an office yet both solicitors involved hadn't yet you know had the chance to get back to their computer tell us everything had happened we we as an office weren't sure if we were able to hand out the keys yet so we couldn't and these guys are sitting in the car park in the truck they're waiting like we had what in the last week we've had a couple of PEXA settlements around midday-ish really early in the afternoon people have got their keys after lunch they've moved in they're sorted like it's it takes the stress away from everyone the agents even guess from everyone's perspective having multiple settlements in a day everyone's day just moves along that's it and with a physical paper settlement you have to remember you have a clerk running around 
generally the CBD, um, that's having to get to each settlement and they've got a settlement every 15 minutes. So if one person is late or if there's an error on something that needs to be fixed, that can potentially cause a domino effect where they're then late for every other settlement. That can mean that your settlement that was supposed to happen at two o'clock is actually happening at four o'clock now. Um, So the pecs are... We love it personally. My boss is now on board with it. He's loving it. Um, and it's we've had nothing but positive feedback on it so far. Um, it's not mandated, so people aren't obligated to do that. Some people do feel a little bit funny about so much money being transacted online Um, but we do take all the necessary steps there's security measures insurance that kind of thing um, to to really protect the clients yeah i mean banks now are transferring billions and billions of dollars a minute you know around the world you know digitally like it's um it's basically the way it's going to be now there's no physical you know transfer of, of monies anymore so just um talk us through what does a physical settlement like we say settlement you've got a clerk running around so yep. what what how does that work like talk us it's through that a little amazing bit amazing because after such a big build up to settlement it's literally over in about 5 minutes so you have a representative of each party so buyer solicitor seller solicitor and then a representative from each bank so the bank that's releasing the mortgage off title and the incoming bank that's naturally loaning the buyers their funds so those four parties will meet up Um, it's generally meeting up at the seller's bank Um, everybody all at once will just hand over all of the transfer documents everybody just cross checks them to make sure there's no spelling errors it's all signed everybody will then exchange the checks again everybody does a cross check to make sure we've got the right amount of money it's literally are you happy? Are you happy? Are you happy? Yes. Okay, see you later. That's it. That's it. <laughs> done it's like the old easy. briefcase, pass it across yep. the room, we're done. <laughs> so how many it. settlements would your office do in a day? Like, I mean, how many would you have done? Like, what's your record? Like, how many settlements, like, I mean, can imagine it'd be quite chaotic between digital and then, you know, physical, like. It is. I mean, the positive thing with the digital is that by doing the online settlements, we're taking those away from the clerk. So he Mm. doesn't have to worry about Mm -hmm. any of those. Um, The lead up to Christmas was quite ridiculous. Um, I think some people alone, I know I myself on the last week of December had about 17 settlements myself. So... I think on average we've had about 30, sometimes shy of 40 contracts a day that's settling. Um, Obviously that's too much for one clerk to handle, so we just need to enlist the help of other clerks to get it through. Um, But yeah, we can have anywhere between two settlements a day to 40 40 plus settlements a day. It really depends on the time of year, but Christmas is... It's chaotic. Ridiculous. (laughs) Ridiculous. <laughs> so when the clerks do their physical settlement, yep. like you're then notified? We are. So we get a phone call immediately as soon as that settlement has gone through. So our process then is to call the client straight away. So they are notified immediately. And at the same time, we're then notifying the real estate agent in writing. So that way there's no delay with the buyer being able to collect keys. Sounds like something out of a, a spy movie, doesn't it? I'm just imagining, you know, <laughs> shiny briefcases and, a, yep, deal's done, you know, and they're yeah. walking away. And then it sounds really, very really interesting. Very I secret. wish it was that cool. It's <laughs> we should do a little mock-up <laughs> of it. how that works, make you guys cool again. So um, Sherry had one question, I think, towards the end. end yeah, the okay. it was, I guess, a sort of something that you touched on earlier about you occasionally see people self-acting and why that can be a bit of a bad idea yes i guess for people then that make the wise decision to seek a professional what should they be looking for what kind of questions should they be asking you know to make the right decision what you know what are the right kind of things that you can be finding out in order to feel comfortable with your choice in whoever you are choosing to represent you yeah i think first impressions count so if you're phoning up an office and you're not really feeling it from somebody I think you need to give every client the time of day it doesn't matter how busy you are you have to be willing to just focus solely on that client and answer any questions that they have Um, so really I think it's about a connection that you can form sometimes on the phone from a questions perspective um, naturally you're going to be asking what they charge 
for the conveyancing process, I would ask them to be very detailed in what they do charge. Some people can appear quite cheap, yeah. um, but there can be a lot of hidden costs with those people. So it's important to find out if they're going to be charged termination costs. Is there additional fees for extensions and negotiations and resettlement, uh, rescheduling of settlement dates? Um, all of those extra charges can add up quite substantially and blow uh, a cost of $400, that was the initial quote, right up over $1,000. Um, so definitely asking them to reiterate their quote, um, asking what they're doing for that, who's their point of contact going to be, um, asking what kind of communication they have. There are a lot of firms that prefer to only deal by email, um, but you need to understand not everybody has access to email, so it's important to really make sure that what your preferences are, that your conveyancer is saying, yes, we can meet that. Um, Something as well, like if you are if you are a first-time buyer and you're dealing with someone that only wants to talk to you by email and you've got all these questions, you've got all these thoughts and concerns and you can't get all of that out in an email. You want to feel comfortable to, in who exactly. you're talking with and that yep. you're heard, you can have some reassurance at least. Yeah, and sometimes things can be misinterpreted in writing. Um, it's easier sometimes to actually say to somebody, this is the process, this is what you can expect, and it does make them feel better. Sometimes emails, I find, can be a little impersonal, so you can get that communication and that, that feel um, on the phone with somebody. I do encourage people, if they don't like the phone, if they don't like email come down and, and meet face-to-face -face with us because, again, meeting face-to-face -face with someone, you can really get your point across and make someone feel a little calmer and more relaxed. If people are more relaxed, they're going to make better decisions and be a little less um, emotional, I guess, mm. throughout the process. So yeah. it's a good customer experience. I mean, it's good old-fashioned service, really. I mean, you know, we're, we've got the same thing happening here where – you know, everything now is done online, you shop online, you make an inquiry online and there's conveyances now which is all online. Like you don't even need to talk to someone. Like you fill out a form, they submit information, you get it delivered through a, your own portal. It's becoming very – it's like automation's getting out of hand, you know, where I think it people is. are going back in full circle now. They're looking for that personal contact, you know, someone to talk to, not going on hold or not going through yeah. 20 switchboards to talk to someone. They just want, hey, help me. Tell me yeah. what needs to be done. So that's something that you know your 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 um, your firm does. I think very well. Is that keeps that good old fashioned. I think that comes back to the the roots of the business mm -hmm. where it does. It hasn't gone too over the top with you know technology and automation. It's yeah. kept its ground roots customer service in place. Yeah, most definitely. And like we say to people all the time, real estate agents always again have lists. Um, so if you're a first home buyer and you have no idea where to start in looking for a conveyancer, have a chat to your real estate agent because they generally have a list of conveyances that they deal with on a regular basis that they know will give you um, a good service and a good result. So there's no harm in, in calling all of those numbers and making a comparison because sometimes it really just comes down to your connection with that person and if you get along with them. If you're talking to someone that's very robotic on the phone, you just may not feel comfortable speaking to them. So, yeah. Well, quite often, you know, I, I you know, refer you guys quite a bit and um, uh, one thing that came up uh, recently was that um, uh, a client said, oh, but I don't know what's going on behind the scenes between you and, you know, the, your recommendations. I said, well, call up anonymously. Don't even mention my name. Yeah. Do the research yourself. And they went, oh, okay. Because, I, you know, they had a bad experience down in Sydney where they were recommended someone and the conveyancer was kind of in favour of the agent to help make sure everything went through and they weren't, you know, um, looking after the client ethically um and they had a bad experience and, and then you know that's when you sort of come back and say well make an anonymous call yep don't mention my name because we've got nothing in it you know that vice versa we, we don't have anything in it there's no financial okay, transactions thanks. between no exactly yep. and that's a good way to do business is just have people on board that are exactly the same sort of you know um have the same morals and ethics that you do and then you promote that and then give them that same customer experience from when they meet us right through to when they meet you and right to the end and that you know gives everyone a good review yeah. So. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So we'll wind up in a second. So before we do, okay. do you have any sort of, I guess, 
not legal advice, but any advice out there to people who might be tuning in and, and helping them make a decision on what could be the path to go down to to um, selling their home with a, with a direct conveyancer? Um, yeah, look, I think just the best piece of advice we can give to people is a phone call doesn't cost anything. Um, there's there's so many firms out there and I will say Colwell Lions because it's something that David has instilled, David Colwell. Um It's nothing for people to come in and have a chat. Um, Even if you're just at that very start process where you're thinking about selling your home but haven't quite made the decision yet, come and have a chat to us. Um, We can run you through the whole process generally, um, put you in contact with with the agent and say, look, give them a go. Um, Make some inquiries. It's, I think, definitely talking to people from the get go is is the one thing that people really need to just do, um, as opposed to a lot of people dive into hasty decisions um, and sometimes regret it later. So that would be my number one piece of advice: just call up and talk to somebody first, um, local law firm, local real estate agent, whatever the case might be. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Sheridan, anything else to add before um, we wind up? Thank you for coming. Thanks for spending thank you for having your me. very precious time with us. That's okay. It was relatively painless. Yes, so. It's been quite enlightening. So hopefully, you know, our, our listeners and, and, and obviously, you know, we promote this out there as well as some socials and we're on Spotify and Apple and all that other cool stuff as we are now. Yep. Um, hopefully, look, if it helps one person, then we've done our job and that's Most kind of definitely. why we're doing this. So, yep. We're all in it to just make sure that we're giving the right advice and good advice to people. So thank you very much for coming. No problem. So Julie at Coldwell Lines, everyone, if you want to make contact with her or you need her, then definitely give her a shout out and uh, see if she can help you with uh, with your next sale. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you.